Peter says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these He has given us His very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. That's an encouraging word when you stop to really contemplate what is being said by Peter in that, in that verse. God hasn't just given some of what we need. He hasn't just come to a certain point and, and then cast us out on the road of life alone. God has given us everything that we need for godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. So like the encouraging word that we just read here in Peter, in, in 2 Peter, in light of God's provision of power provided to his children through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul speaks to the same subject. This morning I'm going to be talking to you about living in the light. We'll start by turning in our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5 and we'll read the first two verses to start here. So Paul says, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. You know, there's many good examples out there. But there's no better example for us to follow than the example of our Creator. God designed us. He knows how we operate. He, he knows the very best way for us to live. In Colossians chapter 2, 9 and 10, the Apostle Paul says here in his message to the Colossians, For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. So, in Christ, in following Christ, in patterning our lives after Him, we find the very best way to live. God is our Father and we're loved by Him. And because we are loved by Him, He humbled Himself and became a man so that He could pay the penalty of sin that we deserve to have. The sacrifice of his own life for us, met God's full requirements for sin to be punishable by death. He said, the penalty of sin is death. But God paid that full penalty himself for us. Not because he had to, because he delighted in that. It pleased him to do so, to give of himself to us, to show his great love for us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5.21, and I think part of that was sung this morning in our worship set, we're told God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In preparation for his sacrificial death for us, Prior to dying on the cross for us, Jesus was talking to his disciples and he said this. He said, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. God considered us his friends. Even while we were still sinners. He considered us his friends and laid down his life out of his great love for us. You know, I know we talk about this all the time, and, and almost every Sunday we come to church, we reflect on this. This isn't old. This is new. We have to constantly remind each other 
of the goodness of God and the love of God that has been poured out on us. Love that we didn't deserve, but nonetheless has been given. So in realization of this, imita- in imitation of Jesus, Paul says that God desires us to live a life walking in the way of love towards Him and towards others, just as He walked in the way of love towards all of us. And the love that Paul encourages the saints to live by and live in imitation of is defined in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 4-7. to We all have read this if we've been a Christian for a long time. We've read this, but let's be reminded this morning, leading into what we're going to be talking about here, living in the light. Love is patient, walking in the way of love. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. If we love in this way as imitators of the one who loved us, we will be treating other people selflessly in a way that builds them up rather than tears them down. I ask myself this, and you probably are asking yourself this too. How is this possible? Can we do this in our own strength? Many have tried to keep the standard. Many of us. I've tried. You've tried maybe yourself. You've tried this in your own strength. What happens when you try to do this in your own strength? You can't do it. You'll fail. The sin nature within us wrestles against the will of the Holy Spirit for us to be like this. We must yield our lives to the will of the Holy Spirit and then, and only then, Only then will we have the power to love others and to love God in the way that He desires us to. So when we yield to the will of the Holy Spirit, we turn away from the old pattern of living that's resident within our sin nature. And and we give ourselves over to this new holy nature birthed within us when we submitted our lives to Jesus Christ. And some have said that because God has given us grace, now we have license to pursue sinning. Because our sins have been paid for by Jesus, He covers over our sin, so we shouldn't have to be worried about that. We just live how we want, and God will take care of us. Paul speaks to this kind of reasoning in Romans Chapter 6, 2, when he says, By no means shall we live this way. By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? The scriptures teach us that the desire to continue in sin shows that we have a misunderstanding of God's abundant grace and a contempt, really, for the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And when we look at things this way, we're not walking in the way of love. The opposite of love is hate. Love for God does not, according to the 1 Corinthians 13 definition, does not dishonor Him. It does not dishonor others. Love for God is not self Seeking. Love for God is other-centered. Love for God does not delight in evil. And this is why Paul continues in our text today to say this. And the reason I've spent so much time on this this morning, people, is there is a very important thing that I, I think we need to have sober minds about. 
I fear, and I'm going to launch into this a little bit because I fear that certain folks have been raised in the church, have gone through church, and have never really understood the love of God. They've never really given their hearts over. This is an important thing. We can go through our lives going to church. We can go through our lives going to Sunday school and really have, have never come to know God. Yeah, we know all about Him. Some people have never come to know God and they've been in the church their whole life. And this morning we're going to talk about sin and how it's not God's plan for us to continue in it. It says in verse 3 of our, of our text this morning, but among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or greed because these are improper for God's holy people. You notice how he says God's holy people? We're not our own. We belong to the Lord. God is holy. And we are His people. We are God's holy people. There shouldn't even be a hint of sexual immorality or impurity or greed because they are improper for us. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking which are out of place. Rather, thanksgiving. Now we all know this. The world that we live in is in an immoral place. And, and there's temptations on every corner in our society to give way to living in a way that does not please God. But just because temptations flourish around us, it does not mean that we have to give in to them. Children of God, you've been given a new nature. Yeah, I'm saying this morning, if you've fallen, if you failed in this area, you can go to the Lord. If anyone sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us for, of all unrighteousness. But this morning, we have to understand that if we have surrendered our lives to Jesus, a new nature has been given to us. We are asked by God to step into the light and to step with Him in overcoming the old nature and living the new nature. 2 Timothy 2.22, Paul tells Timothy this and says it in this way. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call the Lord out of a pure heart. There was an old saying, and I'm going to say it because everybody probably knows it, you know. Just because the crows are flying over your head doesn't mean you have to give them permission to make a nest in your hair. The crows are going to fly over your head. In this case, the sins that abound in the society because our society is full of it. They're going to fly past you. They're going to fly over you, all around you. And you're going to have decisions to make. I want you to know that God promises that in Him there is power. There is overcoming power. You don't have to give way to the old man or the old lady. You don't have to give way to that. Greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. Who overcomes? It is those who are bought by Christ's blood and have been cleansed and filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's why the Lord says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Sometimes we'll give in to a lie. The devil's a liar. Always has been, always will be. He's the father of all lies. And sometimes he gives little thoughts in our head. Ah, that's not so bad. Just a little bit of immorality, a little bit of impurity, a little bit of obscenity, or a little bit of greed in our lives. What's the hurt of that? It's not all that bad. Come on, I mean, look at the worst case scenario out there. Look at how they're living out there. Eh, this isn't such a big deal. Oh, 
You can, you can hear the tempter, right? Being too good is too boring. Being too good is too boring. Don't be too good. Just be sort of good. Have a little bit of fun with sin. <laughs> My friends, the Bible teaches us that sin is deceitful. Sin is a deceiver, just like the father of sin is a deceiver. Sin lies to us, telling us that somehow yielding to it will enrich our lives and make them somehow better. A writer of the book of Hebrews tells us, in Hebrews chapter 3, 12 to 14, he says this, he says, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. The Bible also teaches us that sin is like yeast that gets mixed in with a batch of bread, and the yeast spreads. It just takes a little bit of yeast, but it spreads throughout the whole batch. And we're lying to ourselves if we think that we can keep a little sin little. The problem with allowing a little sin to roost is that it doesn't stay little. It spreads like yeast through bread dough in our lives and, in, and, it, and in the lives, it, it can affect the lives around us, the people that are touching us too, like the people that are in our lives. <sighs> For believers that are compromising, so many believers, so many believers, and maybe you've been in this batch too where you, you've struggled and you've been failing. So many believers are dull spiritually to God because they've compromised their standards and they've let sin get a foothold inside of them. This is not what God wants. This is not how God wants us to live. He wants us to be free of that. Paul is saying that immoral and covetous behavior is not fitting for God's holy people. The kind of behavior that has been pretty much stamped, approved, by every facet of our society. Paul had it in his day, we have it in ours. You know what I'm talking about. You can't go anywhere without this being thrown in your face, without it hitting you. The crows fly by. This kind of behavior, if we allow ourselves to go there, becomes catastrophic. We find ourselves stumbling and we fall into sin. It's not what God wants, right? It isn't. But it happens. It does happen. This being said, however, the Apostle Paul makes it abundantly clear that no true believer in Jesus who has been truly saved continue, continues to live a life of rebellion to God. I'm going to approach this very seriously. There has not been a true change of heart. There's been an acknowledgement that Jesus is God, but He hasn't become the Lord where there's been a submission to Him. Do you know that the devil himself acknowledges that Jesus is God? He does, and He, he trembles. Because he knows what's coming. <laughs> he knows that he's under judgment. But it doesn't negate the fact that he doesn't recognize God and, and his authority over him. He knows it. So, across the nation, there's people sitting in pews all across the nation that have never really, truly been born again. There's never been a surrender. There's never been repentance. There's only been religion. Paul goes on further with his thought in verse 5 saying this. He says, 
For of this you can be sure, he says. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For such, because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Now, I, I'm, I'm not talking about people that are struggling here, that make mistakes, that sometimes make willfully bad decisions. All of us do that at times. There's not a person here that can say that they're not, uh, they're not being confronted by sinful decisions and failing sometimes, right? We know this. I mean, even if we don't do the good that we know that we ought to do, that's a sin. That, that's failing the standard. God's grace has been given to us to take away our sin. What I'm not, I'm not talking about those the, the, the things that are happening in our lives where God's trying to teach us to give up, like to give up, um, you know, if we give up something that's bad. I got a foul mouth. Oh, I, I bang the hammer on the end of my, my thumb and I find myself swearing. Oh, Lord. <sighs> Out of the same mouth should not come blessing and cursing. Salt, and, salt water and fresh water shouldn't be coming out of the same fountain. Lord, I'm sorry. I, I really don't want to be characterized by this. I'm really sorry for slipping here. You know that my heart is towards you and I want to serve you. But please forgive me for that. The, the, you see, all of us face those kind of things. And sometimes we fail. And there's grace for us to come to his throne of grace and receive from him cleansing. Now, the blood of Christ covers over us, so we're, we're his children. The prodigal son still is the child of the father, even though he's messing it up. But, my friends, there are, there are people that are living in a pattern of disobedience, continually disobeying God, refusing to give up disobedient ways saying, dug in, saying, I'm not going to change this part of my life because I'm not going to. This is a sober reality. There's people out there that think they're saved and they're not because they haven't surrendered. They haven't actually asked Jesus to be their sacrifice, really. They might say it with their mouth, but in their hearts they're saying no. They're saying, no, I don't want him to be the sacrifice for my life. I'm content living in my life of sin. I'm content doing the things I want to do, and I'm not going to give that over. Sure, I'll come to church with my, my grandmother, or I'll come to church with my husband, I'll come to church with my wife, I'll come to church with my aunt or uncle, and I'll, and I'll put up a good front, and that part of my life is a good supplement. But they've never actually experienced breaking of the shackles. Now, Paul's day, there were Christians who, who were not true believers, who were arguing with him, saying that they could live in constant rebellion and, and sin against God and others and, and just get away with it. They produced these arguments to try and convince ignorant Christians that they could just continue to live however they wanted to and still enter God's kingdom. A relationship with Jesus was merely a fire insurance policy. It doesn't have a whole lot of meaning. It's just, I, I have that part of me, and you know, as long as I do this and that and the other thing, thing a couple of times a week, a couple of month, uh, times a year, whatever, I'm good. My fire insurance policy is up. That's salvation by works, friends. That's not salvation that is true. Salvation by grace is, is given to us when we surrender, when we believe. And if we believe God is who he says he is, if we believe that Jesus is who he says he is in the Gospels, how is that going to affect the way that we live? It's going to change us. 
And when the Spirit of God comes within us, He gives us overcoming power. He brings light into the darkness. He gives us strength to be overcomers and more than, than just slaves to our old man. He gives us freedom to be holy. Grace to be holy. Grace to imitate Him. It's so heartbreaking to see how many professing Christians think they're saved. But in reality, they're not true believers. The Lord spoke to this too. In Matthew 7, 21 to 23, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only one, the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons, in your name perform many miracles. And then I'll tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. To be a professing Christian who acknowledges Jesus with their lips, but then denies, denies him by their lifestyle, the truth of the matter is this. If our lives are not truly surrendered over to him, do we? Have we ever really known the Lord? Has he ever really known us? Have we had that at one that atonement experience with him? That comes with a heart that yields? If, if we believe and we confess with our mouth, we will be saved. The question is, what does true belief look like? The Apostle John backs up both what Jesus says, what the Apostle Paul says. The Apostle John says this in 1 John 3, 5 to 10. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. Yeah, that's beautiful. And in him is no sin. No one who, who lives in him continues sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or knows him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go sinning on sinning because they have been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor does anyone who does not love their brother or sister. Those are God's words. Those aren't the words of this preacher here. That's God's word. Being born again means surrendering to Christ and being filled with His Spirit means that a new man has been born in you and the characteristics of the new man are the fruit of righteousness. Now, it's not talking about here where we stumble and we fall and we make mistakes or we make a bad call. Sometimes we find ourselves off a path and we need discipline. God disciplines those he, he, who He loves he brings us back to the right path because He loves us and He disciplines us. And if we're not disciplined by God, we're not His children. The reason He disciplines us is because we're struggling still through this life where sanctification is not full. We're becoming conformed to the image of Christ. So we are struggling with these issues of being obedient to God and, and failing sometimes. So that's not what this is talking about. What this is talking about is a calloused, person who has said, I will live my own way and I'm not going to change the way I'm doing things. I can have Christ and I can do this too. And I'm going to just keep doing it. This unwillingness to surrender a heart to God in being holy as He is holy. That's what it's talking about. Someone who's calloused and hardened and saying, no, I'm just going to do what I want to do and I'll keep my Christianity over here on this, on this page, and I'll have my sin over here on this page, and nobody can tell me different. Have you seen this rock the church in the past? I have. Oh, man, this, this is dis so destructive. 
You see it. Broken people, broken families, broken promises. Just, it's everywhere. And God's like, it doesn't have to be that way, folks. Paul, this is why Paul is talking about this. Live in the way of love. Why? Because love honors. Love doesn't delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. So Paul's saying, be on guard against this, friends. Be on guard against this. We can't go judging other people. You know, this, this, this message isn't just for us to sit there and go, yeah, I remember Sally, or I remember Joe. Oh, yeah, they were really kind of flaky. Yeah, yeah. No, this, that's not what this is about. You see, nobody knows the heart of another person outside of God. This is a sober, uh, a sober reminder for us to evaluate what's going on in the fruit of our hearts. Only you can say where you are. I don't know. Sometimes people can put masks on, right? Where is our heart? That's what's being asked here. If our hearts are living in darkness, rebelling against God, but claiming to be in the light. Some people come to church because it's a good business uh, place to get business. Right? Good place to get some sales. Good, good for my... my uh, you know, folks, this is serious. God, God's appealing to people that maybe have a form of godliness, but they don't know him. This is an appeal. It's time to stop the charade. It's time to come full term, full circle and surrender. Surrender because he loves you. And there is forgiveness in his arms. His nail-scarred hands reach out to you and say, I've, I've loved you and I'm inviting you to come to know me and to give up this charade. It's time to be true. It's time to be pure. It's time to let me flush it out. You can't because I, you're never going to, some people come to church, they say, oh, I, I can only go so far in my Christianity because I, I'm not good enough. No, nope, you're not good enough, but God is good enough to help you, to transform you, to give you a new heart. You can't put on a new heart. So don't, don't try any longer. Let go of that. Come to the Lord. Come to the altar. Come to Him. His arms are open wide. He loves you. He doesn't want you to perpetually live in this charade. He wants you to live in freedom. <laughs> Today is the day that God is calling certain people. And I'm not sure if it's online or maybe there's someone here. I don't know. God knows. This is between you and the Lord. It's time for us to repent if we've been living in this pattern. Today is the day of surrender. Today is the day where you can be set free because whom the Lord sets free, that person is free indeed. Free indeed. Shackles drop off under the power of God. When we yield to the Lord, shackles fall. Freedom is, it, we're talking about freedom and remembrance day and all that. Well, in spiritual terms, freedom has been won for us through Jesus. We don't have to live as slaves to the, to the, the cravings of our old nature any longer. We can be free. For you were once in darkness, Paul says in, in verse 8 of our text. But now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light. You see that? You are light of the Lord. You are light in the Lord. Why are you light in the Lord? Not because you're so great. Not because you're such a shiny example of sainthood. It's because the Spirit of the Lord lives inside of you, and He is holy, and you are the lamp that He lives in. And your, 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 your heart attitudes and your, your life ought to reflect what's inside. Live. Just be yourself. In the Lord, let His Spirit live in you. Let 
His Spirit encourage you to get out and to be the salt and light that He's called you to be. Nothing can stop that. He's given you everything you need to live a life that is holy and godly. Live as children of the light, for the fruit of light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. How do you know what pleases the Lord? His Word shows it. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. Take your Bible off the shelf. Or if you got it in your phone, type in Bible Gateway. And get into the Word. And the Spirit of God will show you new things. You can grow even if you've been a Christian for 70 years. Hungering and thirsting for righteousness, you don't have to be dull because it's been so long. You can be fresh in the Lord and He can be giving you new insights. His Word is truth and it's power and it's life. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It's shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret, but everything exposed by the light comes visible, becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why Christ, it is said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Let your light shine, saints. Let your light shine. Not because your good works are what earn your salvation. Let your light shine so that they may see your good works. Because good works flow from the Holy Spirit. And glorify your Father in heaven. This world is living in darkness. We need to be the light of the world that he's called us to be. And push away. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness. He's given this new nature to you. The capacity to do what is right and to do what is good. A capacity that was meant to love your Savior, to love Him and honor Him and live for Him and to love others that God's placed around you, whether they're non-Christians out in the community or whether you're brothers and sisters in Christ. He's given you the capacity to love them. And don't give the devil a foothold. But shine your light, expose the deeds of darkness for what they are, and have nothing to do with them. Come to an understanding what this, you know, there's so much compromise out there. Oh, well, you know, you know, maybe it's like, hey, if your conscience is pricked by the Holy Spirit, don't justify it. Stay away from it. Have for me in my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to, we're not going to have anything to do with this. And don't, don't let your battling conscience because the enemy is there, your flesh is there. Oh, well, you know, a little bit of sin makes it a little more interesting in life, right? No. Lie. Lie. Lie that leads to spiritual destruction and, and dullness and pain and suffering on all fronts. So then Paul says in verse 15, he says, Be careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Always give thanks to God, the Father, for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have such an opportunity we have such an opportunity to be the light of Christ and to shine for Him here in 100 Mile and surrounding area and also to be a giving and ascending church where we, we have impact overseas and in home missions and at the camp and in Africa and Asia and wherever God has planted missionaries that we've linked arms with. We have this opportunity. The days are dark. Yes, they are, but God's light is brighter than the darkness. Darkness is overcome by the light. We can be overcomers. You don't have to sit there and be a defeated saint and, 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 and give way to your, your flesh. No. You can have the righteousness of God in Christ and live the way that you say you believe. You can be that. And when we're like that, people, we shine. That's what this world needs. I'm sorry 
for the things that I've done in my life that have not been pleasing to God. I pray that you're saying the same thing too. Man, if, if something that Pastor Clint sang this morning is pricking your spirit, just give in. He's gentle and humble, and he loves you, and he just, he's just saying, come, come. You know that, that parable of the prodigal who was prodigal in his heart? You know, I'm not even worthy to be called his son any longer, right? I think I'll go home, though, because at home is where I belong. Maybe he'll just make me a lowly servant. And he's standing afar off watching as his son comes down the road. And he's weeping and he's saying, bring out the fattened calf. Let's have a feast. Bring the, bring the best robe and put it on my child. For he was lost and now he is found. <sighs> he was on a path that was leading to destruction and pain and suffering. And now he is found. This is the heart of God for his children. And even if you're struggling right now and something I've said has pricked you in the spirit, don't put off coming back. Just let go. Let go and, and run to the Father, his arms open wide. This whole thing that we're singing about in church, this is real. The Lord loves us. He wants us to be with him. And close to him. He doesn't desire this distance that we create. He wants us to be close. If we're here this morning and we really haven't surrendered to Christ, we've made a mouth profession of faith but never actually given God the throne of our heart, today is the, time. It is the day. It's time. It's time to give it up. There's nothing out there but pain. Michael W. Smith sang a song once when I was a kid, and I remember hearing it. I'm dating myself, right? All you're missing is a heartache, a disillusionment for a keepsake. There's nothing out there in the darkness. Why are we holding on? There's nothing for you. There's life and peace and love, and goodness for you in Christ. So let's stop being religious and become a follower of Jesus. Being filled with the Holy Spirit brings comfort to the battle-weary and beaten soul. It says, Wine is a mocker. Wine leads to debauchery. Why do people do this kind of thing? Why do people run to these things, to addictions? It's because they don't really understand that that's only, that's their heart crying out for meaning. They're looking to fill the void and heal the pain and mend the wound that's inside the Holy Spirit or trying to forget about it. It's all a counterfeit of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit really has freedom, has real life, has real peace, has, has goodness. Come to the Lord. Let go of the things that are entangling your feet and come to Him this morning.